All right, Destiny, it looks like it's just me and you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Do you have any questions about anything? No. Okay. So I guess what I'll do is I'm just going to pick up uh, from when we left off. Let me just um, erase this. <clears throat> Okay. okay, so we talked about how glucose gets into your blood, and then uh, we talked about other chapters how your body has to make channels. So your cell has to make a channel for glucose to come in because glucose doesn't uh, isn't able to pass across the membrane. It doesn't follow that rule. It has to be small and uh, uncharged and hydrophobic. And you know that sugar dissolves in water, so it's not like a big surprise. So insulin uh, binds to a receptor here. And when it does, it creates a signal into the DNA to create this channel, which is made out of proteins. Remember we have the DNA that goes to RNA that goes to protein. <clears throat> and so this channel is a protein that allows glucose to go inside the cell. And the first thing that happens to glucose is that it undergoes uh, a process called glycolysis, which we covered in glycosuite and lysis is to break apart. So basically, this is the process that your cells do to break apart uh, glucose from your food. Remember, this is what you would call carbs. They've been digested into maltose, which are disaccharides. And then in your stomach, it's been digested first, further just to glucose. Um, and on your nutritional label, that's what we're talking about. So this is just broken down carbs um, and the individual sugar molecules. And we have to break that down further in the cell to release the energy that you need to use for everyday things like writing and breathing and thinking what you're doing right now. Okay, so <clears throat> glucose comes to the cell. This occurs in the cytoplasm. So you need to know where these occur for the exam and I will ask you. Uh, glycolysis is in the cytoplasm. And remember I said we have you need to know what goes in and what comes out. This isn't biochemistry, so you don't need to know specifics, but what goes in is glucose, right? It's a glycolysis. And we have to pay uh, two ATP in order to get this thing to start. It's kind of like pushing the rock down the hill. You got to put in a little energy to get the pathway to, to begin the rock to start rolling. Yeah, but we're gonna get some payoff from this, you know, uh, just like you would from a dam where the water's flowing down. And our payoff is uh, ATP. So we get four ATP made directly. And I'll show you how that happens in a second. And remember, these are our electron carriers. And these are gonna make electricity. Um, and in the electron transport chain. So not in the cytoplasm, but we don't want electricity shooting around in the cell because it would be the same as electricity shooting around in your body. It's not a good thing. So these NAD pluses that we talked about earlier become uh, NADH because we add a hydrogen and an electron to it. And now it's ready to carry electrons. So this will end up in the electron transport chain. We're not gonna worry about that right now. So we, we have minus two ATP and we have plus four ATP. So in the end, we're gonna get two, we'll get four ATP, but our net is two ATP from there. And we're also gonna get out two NADHs. And then this molecule pyruvate, and I'll show you the structure. It's not, it's not complicated. You probably, before you knew what this was, you might go, oh my God, or this, 
You know, what is that crazy molecule? It's just a chemical, it has a formula, it's not a big deal, and it has a fancy name. Um, I'm not gonna go into the, the naming of this, but just know, make sure you know that two pyruvates come out. So for the test, you need to know that uh, one glucose, one glucose, two ATP go in, four ATP, two NADH, and two pyruvates come out of glycolysis. And I'm going to show you this, but you don't need to memorize it. So this is on a, a molecular scale. This is how this works. Here's glucose, and we have all the chemicals. You know, it's C6, H12, O6. We have all the, the, the structure of the glucose molecule here. This uh, kinase, so, so for the test, you need to know what a kinase is. These are really important molecules. They add phosphates. And we know that, at, and usually that's from ATP. So we know that adding phosphates allows us to live. And that's why they're critical. And a lot of human diseases are caused by uh, defects in these kinases. They're an enzyme, right? So all enzymes are proteins. That means they have a gene that is in your DNA and that makes RNA and that makes this worker, uh, which is an enzyme. And its job is to add a phosphate. So this kinase, at, specifically adds to hexose sugars. That's why I call it, it's called hexo. And glucose is a hexose because it has six carbons. So it adds a phosphate um, and it adds it to the number six carbon. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's why it's called glucose six phosphate because it's glucose, but it has a phosphate on the number six carbon. So this molecule is different than the one before it. And then, do you remember what an isomer is? We learned that in, in chapter five, Ch it's, chapter four. It's the same, right? Yeah, so an isomer is a molecule that has the same parts, right? Iso is same and meros is part. And this is an enzyme, it ends in ASC, so this is a protein. And its job is to rearrange this glucose 6-phosphate using the exact same parts into a different molecule. And fructose, and, and, and we learned this, oh, come on, don't do this to me. <clears throat> My computer is freezing. Oh, there we go, okay. Can you still see the screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> fructose, and if you, if you want to review, you can go back to chapter uh, uh, five, when we learned, learned about the sugars, uh, the first part of that, fructose is also C6H12O6. It is an isomer of glucose, but it's arranged differently. So it has a different shape. So uh, this phosphoglucoisomerase takes glucose with a phosphate on it. That's what that word means. I know this is like crazy complicated, but really it just means glucose with a phosphate and it's going to isomerize it, which is what it did. So now it's fructose. It still has a phosphate on the number six. It's still, you could add them up. It's still C6, H12, O6. So it hasn't done anything special, just rearranged it. And then we have this molecule. So this molecule works on a fructose with a phosphate, which is this molecule, fructose with a phosphate. And it's a kinase. So what's a kinase do? Adds a phosphate. Adds a phosphate. So we, so we could predict that this thing is going to add a phosphate to a fructose that already has a phosphate on it. And that's exactly what it does. So now we have two phosphates on here. And so we call this fructose 1,6 because this one is on the number one carbon. This one is on the number six carbon. I don't care that you know that. And you don't, I don't care if you know any of this. The reason I'm showing you this is I'm trying to deconstruct these crazy names that are given in science. So this is a fructose, it's a biphosphate, which means it has two phosphates on it, on the number one carbon and on the number six carbon. And again, you don't need to know this, but what's cool here is what, what it's doing. So remember phosphates are negatively charged. And so we have two negative charges on each end of this molecule. And if you have two magnets that are negatively charged next to each other, what do they wanna do? They push away. Yeah. 
So these are going to push against each other. And if you put, if you took a stick and you pushed it in such a way, like, so it's bending, what would you expect to happen to that stick? It would snap. Yeah. And that's exactly what's going to happen. It's going to break this molecule directly in half and we're going to get two, uh, three carbon sugars. <clears throat> so they end up being this. Um, you don't need to know that. Um, and an isomerase, so another enzyme that, that rearranges this molecule into this. So this molecule, let, we'll, let's just give it a chemical formula. So there's one, two, three Cs. Uh, there's uh, five Hs. and two oxygens. So that's what this molecule is. And it's actually a, 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 a version of a three carbon sugar a triose. And this isomerase rearranges it. So again, we can look at the formula. This should be three C3H5O2. And so we have, uh, sorry, this is O3. So there's three oxygens, this one, two, three oxygens, and then one, two, three, four, five hydrogens, and one, two, three carbons. So same chemical formula, different structure, and this is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we, we call this G3P for short. You need to know this, not the whole name, just G3P, because you're going to see in photosynthesis, this is what plants make. And plants run this backwards to produce glucose, and then they link it together in long chains, which, which is what is in your breakfast that you just ate. So plants are making carbs by running this backwards, where you're breaking down carbs by running it forwards. And it all comes down to this molecule right here, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Okay, so. Like I said, you don't need to know this. I'm just showing you this so you don't think it's some sort of voodoo. It's simply taking glucose, putting a couple of negative charges on it to split it in half. And, and that's, where, that's where it cost us our two ATPs. So here's one ATP that we had to pay. There's the other, which, is, which are these right here the energy investment ATPs. Okay, cool. So now we're gonna get our energy, we're gonna get the rewards from doing that. And what we get out of glucose by splitting it in two is we get, elect we get hydrogens and electrons. So we can make our electron carriers. Remember we uh, before back here, we talked about these electron carriers and so uh, all these enzymes, their job is to take these hydrogens off of glucose, put it on NAD plus to make it NADH. And we end up with an extra electron, which I kind of went over. If you're not sure, you can go back and look at that lecture. But this thing, its job is to carry an electron. It has an extra electron, which went on to this nitrogen right here to make it neutral. So that's what we're talking about um, here. So this NAD plus, we took the hydrogen and electron off of uh, there. So it's no longer plus, it's now neutral. And this is gonna carry electrons to the electron transport chain. All right, so that's where we make these two NADHs and I'll just go back Too far. That's this is the space where we make these two NADHs right here. And then here we take the phosphates off. We have two of these molecules now. Because remember, we split the glucose in half. So the, the artist that did this in the book didn't want to draw a twice, so they just put a 
a two designation here. So there's two of these. We're going to take the two phosphates off of this. Um, well, just one, but there's two of them, which we took here. And then over here, there's two of these. We're going to take that phosphate away and we get two more. So we get four ATP right now. And that's what we're talking about right here. So you can see where we paid our two ATP. We paid our two. Come on. Okay. We paid our two ATP in there. Uh, we got our two NADH out and our four ATP out. And then I'm just I'm not going to go back to the slide, but here's our two pyruvate that we get out of there too, which is right here. Okay, so like I said, you don't really need to know all this stuff in the pathway. I'm just showing it so you don't. So I mean, I could tell you memor just memorize this, right? Uh, that you get the glucose goes in and you put two ATP in and it comes out. Uh, four ATP and two NADH and two pyruvates. But I've shown you on a chemical level why that occurs. Um, and, and, and so without you having to know or memorize all those chemicals, at least you get an idea of like how this works. And if you took biochemistry, you'd have to learn it. Okay, so also you probably can find something on YouTube that goes over this. Uh, process if you're confused about how it works, but it's pretty simple. It's just splitting glucose in half to get energy out of it in the form of electrons and ATP. So we have our pyruvate, this molecule right here that came out of the end. So the, the next step, so our first step was glycolysis, which we just covered. So in glycolysis, we know that we have two pyruvates that come out of that. Um, the, the other energy is bound up in ATP and that NADH carrier. So we can't really get any more energy out of this. This is the end result. And, but we can get more energy out of that, but we're not gonna do it until we get to uh, an electron transport. But we do have pyruvate and that still has energy in it. Um, so we can break this down more and release more energy. And the, the way that this is done is we pass the pyruvate into the mitochondria. So remember glycolysis is in the cytoplasm. So this is glycolysis. And from chapter six, you guys learned that there, there's a mitochondria. It has an inner and an outer membrane. And in that mitochondria, it's called the powerhouse of the cell, and that's where most ATP are made. So the pyruvate from glycolysis is going to be put across the membrane of the mitochondria. And to do this, we're going against the gradient, which means it's active transport. So we want to actively transport across here. What do we have to do? What do we need to put in? energy yeah and that, what's our energy ATP since we have two pyruvates remember that two the artist didn't draw it here but from this step we still have two right because they split the glucose in half so there's two pyruvates so everything is double here so we have two of these and that's going to cost us one ATP each to get it into the mitochondria so we, we made two ATP in glycolysis, but we have to use those. So, so right now, if we're keeping count, we have zero ATP, because we spent two. We made two, but we spent them. Uh, and we have two NADHs that we made uh, in glycolysis. And then we have these pyruvates. So, so pyruvate gets across the mitochondria from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria. And this, these blue things are enzymes and the enzymes start working on this. So there, it, it takes away, uh, I just, I boxed this so you could see 
So this is CO2, you guys know this is carbon dioxide, which you exhale. So right now when you're breathing out, the reason you're breathing out carbon dioxide is because your body is taking pyruvates and passing them into the mitochondria. And this is a waste product. So you're, every time you exhale, you're, uh, it's an indication that this pathway is working and you're putting pyruvate into the mitochondria. So the CO2 is taken off. This is what we have left. You don't need to know this, but you should know, remember what goes in. Uh, so what goes in is two pyruvate. And we also have to pay those two ATP. So that's what goes in. And then what comes out is two carbon dioxides, uh, which are here. Remember, there's two of them, so that we got to multiply that by two. Uh, again, we're making more NADH. So we have more electron carriers here. So we're making two NADHs. Uh, this is our total from glycolysis. And then uh, this enzyme uh, called coenzyme A actually attaches to this molecule and it ends up being called acetyl CoA. So um, they just draw the enzyme as CoA. You don't really need to know any of these chemical formulas. But uh, what comes out is 2 acetyl CoA. So remember, for the test, what goes in, what comes out? That's the most important thing. Um, so would it be 2 NADH or would it be 4? Since there's two. Yeah, so it's only showing one here. Okay. But there's but there's two of them. So I multiplied this. This two is independent. This is just uh, signifying a step, an enzyme step. Okay, so there's that, only that's, one in each. This isn't a three. It's just a numbering system. It's not indicated. Oh, okay. Okay, that confused me. So it's only yeah, one no, okay. NADH each. Yeah. So then the two total. Okay. Right. So two any so two CO twos. Well, one for each pyruvate, two NADHs, one for each pyruvate, and two acetyl-CoAs, one for each pyruvate. Okay, so, perfect. Okay, perfect. So we put in the pyruvates and the ATP from glycolysis. We made a, the waste product CO2, which you're breathing out right now. And then we made a couple more electron carriers. So now our total, uh, our, we can summarize what we have left. From glycolysis and moving pyruvate into the mitochondria, we have four NADH. We got two from glycolysis, we still have those, and two here, so two plus two is four. Um, CO2 is just exhaled as a waste product. Uh, honestly, uh, if you wanna break it down, like let's say you wanted to lose weight, this is really how you would lose weight, is you increase your energy, and you output CO2, which has mass. And so the more CO2 you output, the more uh, weight you lose. And then um, acetyl-CoA, uh, st this still has energy in it and we're, gonna, we're not done with it yet. So it goes to the next step. So right now, the only energy molecules we have are these electron carriers for NADHs and these two acetyl-CoAs uh, that we can still get energy out of. All right. So the next step is the Krebs cycle. So we, we'll just call this step three. And again, you just need to know what goes in and what comes out. So in the Krebs cycle, we have two acetyl-CoA. It, it's just showing one, but remember we split this in half in glycolysis. There's, these numbers don't mean anything, they're just steps. So I'm gonna mark them off. So I don't want you to be confused. So the scientists like to number crap. And so there's eight stages of this process. But what happens is acetyl-CoA that we just made combines with this molecule oxaloacetate. You don't need to know that. Um, and that makes citrate. So this is also called citric acid. And that's how it got its name. So the Krebs cycle is also known as the citric acid cycle. And this comes down to a controversy if you actually found it. Uh, oh, some people say this guy wasn't the first one to do it. So they uh, obliged the other people that argued that it wasn't just him and changed it to the citric acid cycle. But 
this name is kind of stuck. So you'll hear it both ways. So acetyl-CoA comes in, it combines with oxaloacetate to make citrate and the cycle starts. It's not a cycle, it's more of a linear thing, but because you start with, what you, what you start with, you end with, they just draw it as a cycle. And that's generally what happens in biology is they make it a circle to signify that the starting product is the end product. And I'll show you that. I don't want to memorize this. I'm just going to show you chemically what happens. So here we have uh, carbon dioxide, uh, CO2 right here. This comes off. And the, again, this is uh, what you exhale. So we have to multiply each of these by two. So what comes out is two CO2 right here. Um, we also make two NADHs right here. And I'm going to have to edit this because it's going to change. And then we make two more CO2s here. So I'm going to change this to a four. And then we make two more NADHs here. So again, I'm going to have to change this to a four as well. And then we make ATP. So remember, it's two times. So we have two ATP. And then we make this other weird molecule called FADH2. These two, these two are very similar, NADH and FADH2. One is more electronegative than the other. So uh, it turns out that FADH2 is stronger, which means it's more able to hold its electrons than NADH, which is weaker at holding electrons. And that's going to be important when we get to the electron transport chain, um, because I don't know if you know this or not, but electron electricity can flow in multiple directions, and and you know we don't want we don't want lightning strikes in our body to just the electricity to just end up wherever it wants to go, and so in order to control this, we need things that are a little more electronegative. So this would be a weakly electronegative and then a little stronger. That assures the electron goes from here to here and not the other way. And then this is going to be a little more, a little, a little more electronegative. And so the electrons will go here and so on and so forth. So in the end, we're going to have oxygen, which is the strongest electronegative molecule that is still reversible. Fluorine is stronger, but you can't really break the bonds of that. So it's not useful in biological systems. Um, and, and so we're going to have the electrons that flow in a very specific direction, just like electricity goes from your outlet to your vacuum. And there's a way that that works um, to control it and then on to oxygen. And you guys know, you know uh, that different things have different, uh, uh, the, uh, different ability to draw electrons to them. And I'll give you an example. So if I gave you a metal fork and a plastic fork and told you to go shove it in an outlet in your house, which one would you pick? Uh, the plastic. Right, because you know that plastic isn't going to pull the electrons out of the outlet into your body. But the metal certainly will, because metal has a higher affinity for electrons than plastic. And, and we know the difference between metal and plastic is their chemical properties. It's the same thing here. So when we go through the electron transport chain, just keep in mind that the reason that everything is in order is because every, we want the electrons to flow in a specific way. And if something got out of order, it wouldn't flow that way. Um, and it would be not controlled electron flow, which is incredibly bad. It would be the same as you know, your vacuum cleaner just attracting electrical sparks out of your outlet instead of going through a cable. All right, so that's that's pretty much it. And so let's let's summarize here. So we have we now have a total of oh sorry, there's two more NADHs. So we have six of these now. So 
we have a total of 10 of these, 10 NADHs. We made six in the Krebs. We made two uh, turning pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and then we made two in glycolysis. So 10 NADHs. We have two FADH2s. All of these, their job is to carry electrons, and that's it. And they're going to carry them to the electron transport chain. which we're gonna cover in a second. And then we made two ATP, which isn't a lot. It's the same amount that you make in fermentation. So uh, if you wanna see if that's enough to allow you to live, just hold your breath, you'll go into fermentation and you'll realize that after a few minutes, that's not enough ATP and you'll die. So this is definitely not enough ATP for a, a human to survive. Uh, and so these molecules are the important ones right here. These are the ones that contain the majority of energy in the form of electrons. Um, and then CO2 is just a waste product. So just uh, remember the formula when we take in oxygen and glucose, and we give off uh, CO2. Remember when we balanced the equation, it was six CO2. So we made four here, and then we made two making acetyl-CoA. So that's the six CO2 that's in that formula for um, respiration that we, we covered in the beginning. Let's go back here. Right here. So, this explains our, we take in glucose, uh, the oxygen is in the electron transport chain. Carbon dioxide, um, that is uh, what we exhale. And I showed you where that came from. And then water is made through this process. And I'm not gonna read on that, but I just, I wanted you to see that, you know, that's where this comes from. It's not just this simple formula. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff in this era. Right. Okay, so this is just a slide that summarizes the same deal that we just went through in a, in a clear way that I can draw it out. So remember glucose goes into the cell, into the cytoplasm or the cytosol, and glycolysis breaks it down and in the end, we make two ATPs and two NADHs, and we make two pyruvates. Then those pyruvates go into the mitochondria, and they're converted to a, into acetyl-CoA, and we make two more NADHs here. Remember, we use these ATP um, in this process, so they're kind of lost. And then we, once the acetyl-CoA is made, it goes into that citric acid or Krebs cycle. And we make that 6CO2, which goes off into air, the air around us. And then we make those two ATPs. And we make two FADH2s and six NADHs. So we can do the math. Two plus two is four, plus six is 10. And then we have the two FADH2s and then the two APs, TPs, because we use those. So this is what we're left with after all this two ATP. And like I said, most of the energy is right here. And we, uh, once we get this to the electron transport chain, uh, we're gonna make 34 ATP out of this, which is literally 17 times more uh, than we would get without breathing oxygen. All right. Any questions so far? No. Okay. So now we're in the electron transport chain. So uh, we're just going to kind of zoom into the mitochondria. Uh, the mitochondria has an inner and an outer membrane. And the electron transport chain is right inside the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So 
uh, we just talked about that. We only get two ATPs from glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. All that rigmarole we did, that's not enough for us to live. Um, so it's really the electrons that we need uh, to create all the energy that most organisms need to survive. And so remember, these are electron carriers. Their job is to deliver these electrons to this electron transport chain in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And I already told you that we made 34 ATP out of that. So this is just the mitochondria. This is what, so the matrix is where the Krebs cycle occurs. Out here in the cytoplasm is where glycolysis occurs and then the electron transport chain is right here in the inside the membrane in the inner membrane and i'll ask you on the test i'll ask you where's the krebs cycle you should tell me the matrix uh where's glycolysis in the cytoplasm uh where is the electron transport chain in the inner membrane and so on and so forth. All right, so I'm just gonna tell a little story uh, of how this was discovered. So uh, it wasn't until very recently that scientists noticed that there are things they called cyto, which is cell, uh, chroma means color. And so when they were looking at mitochondria, they noticed they there's a machine called a spectrophotometer And we'll talk about this in chapter uh, 10 in, in photosynthesis, but uh, this is a spectrum of light. Photo means light, and it's measured in wavelengths uh, like this. And so different colors of light actually have different wavelengths. And so they can measure these wavelength changes. This is the wavelength of light. And these are nanometers. So remember, this is a billionth of meters. Um, subtle changes, and they can detect the color changes of these cytochromes that are in the inner membrane of the mitochondria uh, whenever they got oxidized. So remember, what does oxidized mean? Does it lose or gain an electron? Uh, lose. Yes. Remember, Leo the lion goes grr. And then they gained electrons. So they're reduced. So we got electrons moving in here. But nobody knew why. They just knew that the electrons moved and these things changed colors and they called them cytochromes. So this is kind of how they discovered the electron transport chain. They knew that this had something to do with producing ATP. They knew it was in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, but they really had no idea like what the heck was going on. They knew that, so uh, when we write cytochromes, nobody wants to write out that long word. So we just use the word cyte. Uh, it's short for cytochrome. And then there are different ones. So there's cytochrome A and B, you know, typical site stuff where they number with letters or number numbers or Greek letters. So the one involved in this electron transport chain is called cytochrome C. And it changed from green to red, depending on if it was oxidized or reduced. And what they do is that they deprive the cell of oxygen they didn't make any ATP and these things stopped changing colors. So they knew that oxygen was the elect, an electron acceptor. And this is why we breathe air, oxygen. But they didn't really know how this worked. They just knew it had, was involved with ATP. So scientists, uh, like good scientists, like to break things apart to try to find out what they're made out of. Um, you know, even these these super colliders that we spent billions of dollars on, uh, they're basically taking molecules and ramming them together at the, close to the speed of light so that they blow up so that you can see what they're made out of. It's kind of like if you looked at uh, a Lego fire truck, you can't really see the inside of it or how many Legos it's made out of. And if you smashed it into another Lego fire truck, 
and then it would explode everywhere. And then you could count all the parts. So that's kind of how science works. And so they deconstructed uh, all these things. And this is the actual inner membranes. This is the phospholipid tails and heads. This is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And these cytochromes sit in the inner membrane. And they knew that the electrons, at, once they deconstructed this, came from NADH, remember that's the electron carrier, and, or FADH2. Uh, some of these remain in the Krebs cycle, we know that. And though these electron carriers gave up electrons that went through these cytochromes and ended up on oxygen, where oxygen combined with hydrogen and produced water. And this is the water production, the 6H2O, and that chemical formula. So that, that's what they kind of figured out. And this is in the, like the mid-60s. Um, and so they started breaking it down more. And so today, this is, we know that the, the electron transport chain is made up of enzymes. Uh, sometimes we call them complexes because there's more than one protein in it that are involved in this transport of electrons from NADH and FADH2. So uh, if we go, let, let me just, I'll just start with these complexes. So there's, we have complex one, fitly named, it's the first, complex two, then three, then four. So you have, you'll need to know the order of these uh, for the exam. So if you did this, you could just draw the, all four complexes next to each other. Um, all, so remember back uh, in chapter seven, we talked about uh, integral membrane proteins, one that span the membrane. So these complex one, three, and four span the membrane. And complex two is a peripheral protein, so it doesn't span the membrane. And remember, when we, when we have proteins that span the membrane, usually they're used to transport something. But they didn't know, they just assumed that. And then uh, we have the, these two other ones that are also peripheral. One is called uh, a coenzyme Q. You can, it, it's called uh, CoQ10. You can buy this stuff, uh, and the re it, it's an antioxidant. You, you can buy it at you know Sam's Club or Walmart or Target, um, and and the reason it's an antioxidant, an antioxidant is something that's good at scavenging electrons, and that makes sense because it's part of the electron transport chain. It's going to be attracting, it is attracted to electrons. Um, so people take that as an antioxidant to help prevent damage from uh, rogue electrons, which can mutate DNA. And then we have cytochrome C. This is the one that we talked about before. So site C. This is the one that changed from red to green. And um, we know that FADH2 and NADH uh, actually give the electrons to this complex. Um, I'm just going to back up a little bit and show you that in the Krebs cycle, uh, when we convert this molecule succinate to fumarate, we make this FADH2. So complex two is actually part of the enzymes that make FADH2. So I'm going to go back to the Krebs cycle real quick. And we're right here. So this is succinate and this is fumarate. So you don't need to know that those. And this is where FADH2 is made by this enzyme that I uh, erased this name. But this enzyme is actually complex two. And so it's interesting that uh, if you were gonna build cars, let's say you started a car company and you were gonna sell them in Texas, where would you build your factory? Texas. Yeah, because it's the closest to it. And so it makes sense that the place where 
uh, FADH2 would be used is the same place where it's made. Um, it's made in the Krebs cycle by the Krebs cycle, but that enzyme is shared. Um, it's shared by the electron transport chain. So it, it's making the FADH2 at the same place that it's used, which makes perfectly sen good sense to me. All right, so uh, this is just a summary slide of what we just talked about. Uh, Sustainate and fumarate uh, in the Krebs cycle. Uh, this is complex too. It makes FADH2 at the site of things. So what I want you to take out of this is the only enzyme shared by Krebs and the electron transport chain is complex two. And since I took the time to write that out, uh, you can bet that it's going to be on the test. All right. So I don't, I don't want you to know this, uh, all of this stuff. I'm just showing you it, what's in these complexes. So uh, it has uh, NADH, CoQ, oxidoreductase. I know that's a, a big word, but if we deconstruct it, we know that it's basically um, an enzyme that reduces uh, uh, oxygen uh, from NADH. So, uh, uh, if you lose an electron, you're reduced. So this is going to remove an electron from NADH. Um, and, and this complex contains uh, this thing called a dehydrogenase, which removes hydrogens. We talked about that before. And those hydrogens come from glucose. Well, originally came from glucose. Uh, and then this is a cofactor. This is an iron, uh, iron ha has the ability to bind oxygen, and so this is iron sulfate. Anyway, what you need to know is these things that are yellow. The other things, I'm just showing you that they're called complexes because there's a bunch of junk in them. Like this one has a lot of different parts. But what you need to know is complex one, complex two, coenzyme Q, complex three, cytochrome C and complex four, and then they go in this order. This is the order. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six parts of the electron transport chain. And in the end, all of these, this electrons end up on oxygen. So uh, FADH2, remember it holds its electrons more tightly. So every one of these is more electronegative. Complex two is more electronegative than complex one. Coenzyme Q is more electronegative than complex two. And that's how we get the electrons to go in this direction. This is better at getting electrons than this is. So the electrons are gonna get pulled off of here onto here. This is better at taking electrons than this is. So the electrons are gonna get pulled off of there and so on. Now, because FADH2 is better at holding its electrons, complex one isn't strong enough, isn't electronegative enough to take its electrons, but complex two is. So FADH2 electrons start at complex two, skipping complex one. That's different than NADH. NADH isn't as good at holding on electrons, and so complex one can pull the electrons off NADH2 and then follow that order. So I'm going to summarize this in another slide, but this is just showing you the uh, relative potential energy. And so things with, with uh, higher potential energy go downhill, like rocks rolling downhill. And so Essentially, this is the order of electronegativity. So, more things that are more electronegative are further down on this scale. Uh, so, these are weakly electronegative. Higher, the higher the number, the more weakly electronegative. 
NADH is weakly electronegative and complex one is stronger. So electrons get pulled here and then they go downhill, right? To oxygen, which is super electronegative, it's almost at zero. Uh, Potentially, which means you cannot, it's not easy to remove the electrons from it. Uh, you would have to put energy in to make this go in reverse. FADH2, see it's a little bit lower than NADH. Uh, and it's about equal here. So this is not, electrons won't flow to complex one. Instead, they go to complex uh, two, which isn't shown here, but it's, it's right here. And then that carries on down to oxygen. So they follow the same path, except NADH goes through complex one, FADH2 does not. And that's going to make a difference. And FADH would never go through one? It always just starts at two? Yeah, it can't. Okay. Complex one isn't strong enough to take the electrons from it. Just think of it as a like a strongman contest. So complex one is weaker than FADH2. So it's never going to win that arm wrestling contest. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, this is a the drawing of it, just to show you. NADH has electrons, right? Uh, and remember, if we go back, it has two electrons because it took two hydrogens, two full hydrogens, which have two electrons and two uh, protons. And so NADH two carries two electrons. When it encounters complex one, the complex one is more electronegative. So it says, give me your electrons, NADH. Uh, it takes them and it moves the electrons through complex one. It bypasses complex two through coenzyme Q, through complex three, through cytochrome C, through complex four, and on to oxygen where we produce water. So that's the order of the flow of electrons um, and the spatial order of how these uh, molecules are in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. That's different and, and we and we have NADH plus and this gets recycled you know it goes back to glycolysis and uh, the Krebs cycle to get reloaded with electrons. FADH2 um, it's will never give its electrons to complex one. It always goes to complex two, and then it follows the same path as uh, NADH. So CoQ, complex three, Cyc, C, complex four, onto oxygen where it produces water. Um, so so the main difference is is that remember this this and this, so complex one, complex three, complex four are integral membrane proteins. And that means they transport stuff. Now the difference between the two is that uh, NADH goes through three of these, one, three, and four, where FADH2 only goes through two. So that means that NADH can uh, has an effect on three complexes, where FADH2 only has an effect on two integral membrane complexes. And that's the point in the end of this. All right. so. With all this said, nobody knew how ATP was made. We knew the electrons and the order they flowed through, but nobody really knew how ATP was made. This guy in the in the late to early 60s, early 70s, Peter Mitchell, um, he proposed what we call the AT, the chemi osmotic. So remember, osmosis is the flow of water, uh, and then this chemi is chemicals. So basically, the chemiosmotic means the flow of chemicals uh, with a gradient to make ATP. Um, all right, so what he proposed is 
remember we have we have these electrons flowing through these complexes, right? And so what he said is, I'm just going to put complex one here. So what he said is, if I have an electron going through here and it's negatively charged, what is it going to be attracted to? And he assumed that it would be attracted to something that had a positive charge, like a hydrogen ion, a proton. And so that the flowing electrons would attract the protons in such a way where they would get pumped across this membrane. So the idea would be not here, but let's say complex four. So the idea would be that these electrons would attract protons in the matrix to go to the intermembrane space. Uh, and then we would get a buildup of this positive charge in the intermembrane space and a negative charge in the matrix. And so this is just a summary slide. The electrons flow, protons attract into them, and they get pumped out. All right, so him and his graduate students, students like you guys, you know, if I came up with this theory, you know, you guys worked in the lab and we were uh, in the lab, we could do this experiment. So here's the deal is that what he said was, is that we're, if you're removing protons, H pluses, across a membrane, hydrogen ions. So how could you test? How could you test to see if you're right? And this is well within the capability of anyone that's uh, listened to any of the lectures in this class. Would you put something that would attract the positive ions to see? Well, it's simpler than that. What, what happens when we add H pluses to a solution? Um, it becomes acidic? Yeah. So all we'd have to do is see if this is more acidic than here uh, across this membrane. And so that's what they did. They checked the pH. Tur turns out it's lower. It's more acidic in the intermembrane space than it was in the matrix. So that supported that theory. And then they also tested for the electrical potential. So positive on one side and negative on another. You could do that with a simple battery tester. It's just done on a, in a smaller chemical cellular level, but it's the same principle. And um, yeah, they found out that that's true. So those a uh, couple experiments, and then there was one more where they they took apart the inner membrane and they put it in uh, an acid to see if it would produce ATP, and it did. And so those three experiments show that Peter Mitchell's theory was supported that as the electrons move, the hydrogens are pumped across the membrane and he won the Nobel Prize in 1978 uh, for this theory of ATP formation. So this is a super busy slide. It really was meant to be an animated slide, but um, I'll, I'll kind of deconstruct it for you since I, can't, I uh, don't think it will do the animation, but uh, this is complex one, uh, which is here in blue. And what's happening is the electrons are flowing across here and they get pumped out. Let me let me see if I can find a YouTube video on this. This is be so confusing. Yeah. Most of the energy harvested from organic molecules during glycolysis. And okay, let me screen share this. Uh, 
YouTube video. Share. Web cycle is stored in NADH. NADH and FADH2 molecules give up their high energy electrons in the third phase of cellular respiration, electron transport and ATP synthase, where most of the cell's ATP fuel is produced. The electron transport chain is an array of molecules, mostly proteins built into the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. It's kind of blurry. Let me try this one. Welcome to the next lesson in the third in the TCA cycle. Also note. Thank you. Arizona homeowners, all the electric companies are raising their rate this year, but you can stop. So a proton gradient that drives ATP synthesis of the slide molecules the eighth valve well, in a will sit in brain struck long as NADH. Let's try this one. They are, are done. All eukaryotic cells, from yeast to those that make up the human body, contain membrane bound organelles with specialized functions. Mitochondria are double membrane organelles that harness most of the energy that cells need to grow and reproduce. Nearly all of this energy comes from reactions that take place at the inner mitochondrial membrane. One of the key roles of this membrane is to act as a barrier to positively charged particles called protons, thus allowing a concentration gradient to be maintained where the intermembrane space has far more protons than the matrix. The membrane also contains a large protein complex called the F1, F0 ATP synthase which uses the proton gradient. And we're going to cover this in a second. This is this is complex five. So yeah, it's going to drive the synthesis of ATP molecules. These ATP molecules ultimately provide the energy for most of the cell's reactions. Just as man-made power plants produce electrical energy by using the flow of wind, water, or steam to rotate a turbine, the synthase makes ATP by using proton flow from one side of the inner membrane to the other to rotate protein subunits. If there is no proton gradient, synthase subunits stop rotating and the cell can quickly become starved of energy and die. At the heart of this system are four protein complexes. Number one through four. Complexes one, three, and four directly pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. Complex two does not directly pump protons, but it does promote proton pumping in complexes three and four. Proton pumping requires energy, and the four protein complexes get this energy by transferring electrons through a series of coupled reactions. This linked process of electron transport is why the four complexes are collectively referred to as the electron transport chain. Let's focus on complex one. A byproduct of sugar metabolism called NADH 
deposits two high energy electrons in complex one, where they are passed along a chain of redox centers. Remember, redox is oxidation reduction. So that simply means moving electrons from one molecule to another. Redox centers are clusters of atoms that have different affinities for electrons based on their unique atomic configurations. Let's closely consider a pair of redox centers to reveal two reasons why an electron moves from the top redox center to the bottom. First, the bottom redox center has higher affinity than the top one. Second, the distance between these adjacent redox centers is ideal for an electron jump to occur, which explains why electrons typically don't bypass the bottom redox center. is released each time an electron is passed between redox. Or coenzyme Q molecule. Sorry. This redox center in complex one donates two electrons to a coenzyme Q molecule. So this is from complex one to complex coenzyme two Q. is similar to complex one in two important ways. First, High energy electrons also enter complex two via a byproduct of sugar metabolism. Although here the molecule is FADH2. Second, complex two also transfers electrons between several redox centers before donating them to coenzyme Q. One major difference, however, is that complex two does not use the energy liberated to form proteins. Coenzyme Q molecules from complexes one and two donate their electrons to complex three. One electron is recyclable and can re-enter complex three later, but the other passes through two redox centers before reaching cytochrome C. Cytochrome C carries the electron to complex four. The electron transport chain ends in complex four where a series of reactions involving four electrons converts a molecule of oxygen to two molecules of water. The proton gradient is strengthened because four protons from the matrix are incorporated into water molecules and another four are pumped into the intermembrane space. In the absence of oxygen, the electron transfer comes to a halt, meaning that ATP synthesis also stops. Indeed, the reason we breathe oxygen is so that it can serve as the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. Okay. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of how this works and the, the way that it's set up. Uh, let me go back to the PowerPoint. And, and then I'm just going to, I'll go over this real quick. It's, the same thing that I was trying to show you in the video. We have NADH. It's going to give up its electrons. This is the path that it follows all these electrons. There's really only two. And so as its two electrons go through there, uh, it pumps two protons through complex one. And then again, it pumps two protons through complex three and two protons through complex four. So in the end, every NADH pumps six protons um, for the two electrons it gives up. Um, and so if we, we know that there's 10 NADHs, so in the end, we would, it, we would expect that to pump 60 protons. And then the next slide is FADH2. So again, it's busy, but um, because it skips one, uh, we only get two protons pumped through three and two pump protons pumped through four by FADH2. And so the difference between NADH is that it pumps six protons 
for every two electrons. And FADH2 pumps four protons per every two electrons. So there's, in the, let me just redo the slide. So we have uh, 10, 10 in ADH, which are going to pump 60 protons. And we have uh, two FADH2s that are going to pump uh, eight, four times two is eight protons. Okay, so all of these protons are being pumped across. These vary because of uh, what you saw in the video where some of the electrons were recycled and so on. But let's just forget about this right now. We're just going to, we're going to average everything out. So all these protons get built up in the, in the intermembrane space. This is the, the matrix is, okay, here. This is the intermembrane space. The matrix is here. And all the pumping is going in this direction. So we get this big buildup of protons in the intermembrane space. And that went against the gradient. So we use the energy of flowing electricity, and you guys know it has energy because it powers all kinds of stuff, uh, to create this proton gradient. It's kind of like a waterfall uh, or like the Hoover Dam. So you have all these protons built up, and then they can flow down back by this, you know. This is the normal flow of stuff, so it doesn't, it's passive, right? High, concentration of high to low, um, and it causes this to actually turn that motor, which you saw in the video, and that motor uh, produces ATP, and I'll show you exactly how that occurs uh, probably in the next lecture, but now, now that we know that we have all these electrons that have pumped all these protons, uh, they're going to come back through this complex five, which we we now call ATP synthase because it produces or synthesizes ATP. It's an enzyme, which means it's a protein, right? Um, and it's funny because you know, the, so we're talking about the the mid to late seventies. Scientists can see these uh, ATP synthases. They look like these little these little bumps on the mitochondria. But they had no idea what they were, and they didn't even know what to name them. So they just called them elementary particles. And if you look at electron micrographs from the 70s and stuff, and by the way, what kind of microscope took this? Scanning or transmitting? Um, is that scanning? Now, remember, if you see the inside, then it's transmitting. Uh, so th that's the inside of the mitochondria. And then th again, this is a cross section of the mitochondria. You can see it better. And you can see they didn't even know what to call it. They just called it elementary particles for these bumps, which are really what make ATP. So here's all the protons. They're built up. They go through here, uh, turn this turbine, uh, which produces ATP uh, by combining with oxygen. All right, so I'm going to end here, and we'll pick up exactly how that the world's smallest molecular motor, ATP synthase, you know, it actually spins like the video showed, uh, can take ADP and add a phosphate to it and produce ATP in a, in a big ratio uh, so that we can live, essentially, because without this, we would die. So do you have any questions about anything? No. All right, so uh, game plan is that we're gonna finish up this lecture on Tuesday uh, and then um, I'll do a review. So uh, if anyone wants to show up to the review, they can on Tuesday uh, and we'll do a review for the exam and then the, the exam will open up uh, next Wednesday. And then you'll have until, I believe I open that until Monday at midnight to take the exam. It's going to be the same format as the other exam. 
no outside electronics, headphones, anything like that. It's meant to simulate a standard in class exam. So anything you would expect to be able to bring into an in-class exam, you shouldn't bring to the online exam. Uh, it's not open note, so uh, you will have to study for it. And uh, it covers chapters six, seven, eight, and nine. So we'll finish up all the material for that on Tuesday. Um, and then uh, on Thursday, you will still be able to take the test, but we'll move on to chapter 10, which is photosynthesis. All right. So uh, I'll see you either uh, office hours, which I'm going to have now for a brief uh, 50 minutes, uh, or uh, next lecture. So have a good weekend if I don't see you before then. Thank you, Jim. All right, bye. Bye.